Okay, today I'm very happy to introduce Fabiana Bediaco uh, from UC uh, Berkeley. And we were just saying it's a beautiful view uh, if you go there and then sort of walk up the LBL, you get inspired uh, by the location. <laughs> nice uh, views like this. Um, Fabiana worked with uh, Dan Nocera uh, for his uh, PhD work and for his postdoc work is with Philip uh, Kim. And then he was supported by our, uh, in part anyway, by our uh, science technology uh, center here. And did some very interesting work. It's a bit like uh, graphite, only very different, where you can actually uh, take stacked layers of uh, 2D materials and then intercalate them by pulling in the charges with capacitor plates. And it's sort of a, a really new angle on, on, on that field. Um, today, he's going to talk us about uh, twisted materials, uh, which give us entirely new electronic states and phases and condensed phases and the like. And so I'm very interested to uh, hear that. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, but above all, you know, thank you for the, uh, the invitation to talk. Uh, I have to say that um, I have extremely fond memories of of CIQM. So this is a particularly, uh, I guess, uh, you know, I'd like to say moving uh, experience to be able to give this talk because uh, some of uh, my most influent, uh, influential, or what was most influential and positively influential, I, I should say, um, experiences uh, were, were, you know, involved CIQM and the work that uh, we did in, in Philip's group and uh, and the interactions with, with students, some of whom I see in the participants uh, list um, as well. And so it's, it's really awesome to be able to uh, sort of, in a sense, come back. I wish it was in a more real sense than, than, uh, than this virtual thing that we were, we're doing, but, uh, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take this and hopefully um, we get a chance to interact uh, in person sometime soon. Uh, and so today I'll be telling you a little bit about uh, the work that's been going on in my group over the last few years, uh, where we've been taking many of the 2D materials that I know a large number of you and the participants are, are involved in, in studying and thinking about a lot uh, and uh, exploring aspects of both the, the physics and the chemistry of some of these uh, architectures. And uh, I see from the participants list that we have quite a, a range of, um, of backgrounds, some folk in chemistry, others uh, who are you know, more heavily involved in CIQM and condensed matter uh, side. And so what I'm aiming for with this talk is uh, sort of to make it accessible to everyone. And so I hope that you know, when there are parts that uh, some of the chemistry experts feel are, uh, you know, they know it already and, and you know, it's boring, you could just tune out for a little bit and then other parts, some of you in CIQM might have seen uh, slides like that before, um, and, and you can tune out for those parts as well. But I hope that in the end, we'll all learn something in the process. I'm looking forward to answering questions and discussing. Okay, so with that, I hope everybody can see my laser pointer. Um, here, here's my research group, um, and uh, it's been you know, a real highlight of, of my time at Berkeley to work with, with these folk. Um, they did all of this work that I'm going to share with you. It would not have been possible without them. And if you have a chance to, you know, meet any of them and you ask them, you know, what kind of work they do, at some point they're probably going to describe an experiment that looks like this, where uh, they apply some voltage to a system and, and measure a current. Um, but before you get the impression that this is, you know, how boring and monotonous this could be, I'd like to convince you that. Uh, what is inside this box and the current through which we are flowing uh, in the system can vary quite a bit in, 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 in our group. And in some cases, we're really interested in currents and charges flowing across solid-liquid interfaces or solid-electrolyte interfaces more generally. And other times, we're very much focused on, on charge transport uh, through solids. And this is because ultimately what we want to try to do, uh, you know, to put it in a nutshell, is to understand and control how energy flows in this, these various contexts. And um, there are fundamental uh, questions uh, that, that we're interested in in each of these, but we are also motivated by some more uh, uh, you know, broader impacts that we hope we can at least contribute in some way towards. And, and those are encapsulated in two questions 
The first of which is how do we produce fuels and chemicals sustainably? This uh, topic was the uh, subject of my PhD uh, thesis in Dan Nocera's group that many of you, you know, all of you are familiar with. Um, uh, and, 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 and it does, this question is still something that I carry with me now um, uh, in, in my group. So this is one of the questions that we ask, how can we produce chemicals and fuels sustainably, hopefully taking energy from a renewable resource uh, and, and storing it in some way in chemical bonds or using it to, to drive uh, the production of uh, valuable chemicals. And at each of these stages, you have to think about how charge is moving across interfaces or in solids. The second question is one that I didn't appreciate as much in my PhD, but came to appreciate later on in my time in Philips Group and in CIQM, which is the importance of finding ways to use that energy sustainably, specifically in the context of electronic devices or microelectronic systems. So that the need and the challenge that we face is encapsulated in this fact uh, from a study IBM did in 2017, that 90% of the world's data had been created between 2015 and 2017. So this is quite a striking fact, at least it is to me. And, and so the point here is that, you know, we're, we're generating massive amounts of data. There is an energy cost to us having this uh, Zoom conference call right now where we're transmitting all these images and, and, and audio, um, you know, many thousands of miles uh, away. And so, um, you know, finding ways that we can improve the efficiency of computing is very, very important because fortunately over the last few decades, even though there's been this explosive growth in internet traffic, data services, devices, and so on, there have been commensurate improvements in efficiency of computing that have maintained global CO2 emissions from information communication technology to about 2% of the total CO2 emissions. And for context, that is about the same amount, uh, the same contribution as the aviation industry or flying. So, as we, as we look to our accelerating demand uh, for, for data, uh, if we don't want this 2% number to explode and you actually want it to shrink, then we need to continue these rapid improvements in, in efficiency. And one of the challenges we're facing is that traditional silicon-based transistor miniaturization has basically reached its physical limits. Um, this is sort of Moore's law. And, and so we need to think about new ways uh, to uh, new schemes for ultra low power electronic and computing technologies going beyond Moore's law that allow us to continue increasing the, ener the energy efficiency of our computing devices. Otherwise we're in uh, for some fairly significant uh, environmental uh, uh, and attendant challenges. Okay, so that's the sort of applied motivation. Uh, and, and again, come back to the fundamentals, we're interested in, in understanding controlling the flow of energy. And you can sort of bin this into these two categories where we want to control the physics of solids and surfaces, use that to manipulate interfacial uh, chemistry or electrochemistry. Uh, and then on the other hand, we also try to use our chemical intuition and electric chemical techniques uh, to find new ways to engineer electronic interactions in solids that could then give us access to uh, new paradigms, hopefully of ultra low power uh, electronic switching. Okay, so with that as the backdrop, uh, my research program uh, encapsulates several uh, areas. I'll talk to you about a, a few of them. Um, we're very much invested in, in using quantum materials uh, to study uh, these, these processes. And some, uh, some of what I'll tell you about today is, is, is really to interfacial charge transfer at these systems and what we learn about how strain and, and various deformations play a role in that. Then I'll end with a little bit uh, talking about uh, magnetism in, in two-dimensional systems. So before I go through the details, here are the main takeaways from the talk. Um, I'll introduce uh, you to these structures called moiré superlattices. Many of you in CIQM have heard that, that part a million times before, but for everybody uh, else who maybe is not as familiar, that'll be a little bit of an introduction to you for you um, and how they produce uh, flat electronic bands tell you how then this leads to some fairly interesting electrochemistry and interesting mo modes of controlling electrochemistry. Uh, and then how we've learned about what governs this electrochemical behavior and some of the physics in these systems from electron microscopy, uh, uh, studying spontaneous deformations that arise in, in, in these materials. And then I'll end with a little uh, vignette of our work on, on two-dimensional systems uh, that uh, display long-range magnetic order. Okay, 
All right. So let me tell you a little bit about, about this, and, and we'll begin with, with uh, a discussion of electrochemistry. And electrochemistry uh, principally involves uh, 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 applying some potential across a solid electrolyte interface, usually a solid liquid interface. Um, and that potential drop across that interface drives uh, interfacial charge transfer. And a nice phenomenological model we have to explain how the rate constant, which is basically the, the, the kinetic parameter that you know, describes how fast this charge transfer takes place across the interface, a nice model we have to describe that rate constant is called the Butler-Volmer model. Some of you may be familiar with this model. In any case, all it's saying is that that rate constant is exponentially related to the uh, Gibbs free energy of activation uh, or the, the activation barrier between say the reactants and the products so of the oxidized form and the reduced form in the reduction reaction. And so when you apply this over potential depicted here with eta, what you saw in the animation where we raised uh, uh, the, the, the over potential, what that does is it asserts to decrease that free energy of activation barrier away from the standard value. And so then you have, since you have a, uh, uh, this exponential dependence on the size of that barrier, you end up with an exponential dependence on the applied potential. So that's the Butler-Volmer model in sort of a nutshell. And um, this works fairly well for many uh, systems. It's our sort of go-to model, but it's limited in explaining certain asymmetries that take place in, in certain electrochemical responses, including sort of the so-called TAFL relations that, uh, and asymmetries that emerge sometimes in, in these systems. <clears throat> and even for examples where uh, of, of electrodes that you'd think we have a fairly good handle on right now, like uh, lithium uh, 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 deposition or stripping off of a transition metal surface, for instance, there are significant deviations from Butler-Volmer. And so instead, um, going a one slight step deeper, uh, we can use what's known as the Gerisher formalism, Marcus Hutchitsi model, it's another name for this, which describes the rate of electron transfer in terms of the density of states uh, of the electrode and the probability distribution function of the redox couple in solution. So there are some molecules in solution that are accepting or giving up electrons, that's the redox couple. They have a probability distribution function uh, that basically in a sense, you can think of it as the, the homo or lumo levels of, of, of the molecule. And so this approach, this Gerisher model is used a lot in semiconductor electrochemistry where the electronic structure of the electrode is really important. And because this model teaches that when we apply a potential, what we do, if we even just consider a bulk electrode, we're raising uh, uh, the band manifold of that bulk electrode. And what we're, we're doing is we're uh, uh, increasing the overlap uh, between the electronic states of the electrode and the probability distribution function for, let's say, the empty uh, states of the redox mo molecules. And recent studies suggest that similar considerations may be warranted uh, in terms of thinking about the density of states of the electrode um, specifically for even for transition metal surfaces where you have highly non-dispersive d orbital base bands that play a key role in interfacial charge transfer. Okay, all right. So here is basically the, the description of how that rate constant now depends on this sort of overlap integral. All right, now uh, 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 the, what I described previously is um, for what we call an outer sphere charge transfer, very simple electron transfer reaction where there's no bond formation uh, process uh, involved. But related considerations also do apply to inner sphere reactions. And those are reactions that are catalytic systems. Let's say you wanted to split water to make hydrogen and oxygen as is done in, in the Nocera group uh, at, in chemistry at Harvard. Uh, what you want to think about is what is the density of states of your electrode surface and how does the Fermi level cross the, 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 that uh, uh, band and do you have a strong enough interaction uh, but not too strong interaction with the, the reactants, let's say a proton in solution or hydrogen ion. And what you find is that you can actually correlate the activity of various transition metal surfaces to uh, whether or not their Fermi level crosses this large density of states D band. All right. And without going to any more detail than that and going to the theory, the point I'm trying to drive home here is the idea that manipulating band structure of solids is paramount to, uh, to designing and engineering interfacial chemistry. A lot of the time, the way we do that is by simply changing out what our 
our electrode is going from a, you know, a cadmium to a silver, platinum or rhenium or whatever, right? We change the materials composition uh, totally. And that's one way that we're obviously able to change the band structure of the solid and change its chemistry. There are other ways that our community has, has developed to, to control and facilitate charge transfer. One is by using defects. So it turns out that defects, which you often maybe uh, think of as sort of the undesirable uh, properties of surfaces, turns out that those are can be really effective at uh, mediating interfacial charge transfer because they create localized electronic states that are that uh, are available to participate in that reaction at a suitable energy. And so, for instance, at molybdenum disulfide surfaces, sulfur vacancies have been shown to promote uh, 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 localized states that you can see in uh, scanning transmission, uh, uh, scanning tunneling spectroscopy data, and you can see from calculations how much sulfur vacancies and introduce more and more of these states in the middle of the band gap. Not just atomic vacancies, but steps and edges of, of materials have been shown to be effective at mediating spatial charge transfer uh, and catalysis. And then also there are uh, examples of other types of defects, dislocations, grain boundaries, that you can imagine would have distinctive uh, electronic properties that would then lead to interesting chemistry, and that is indeed what you see. Okay, so in my group, uh, we, uh, you know, sort of being inspired by my time from, from in CIQM, we work with, with two-dimensional solids, two-dimensional crystals, the sort of poster child being graphene that was uh, discovered and isolated in about in 04 and led to the Nobel Prize in 2010. And one of the things that we know about graphene is that its structure, composition, symmetry gives rise to really unique electronic behavior that um, many of you are already familiar with, uh, massless uh, and, and relativistic properties of, of, of the electrons in, in graphene. And, and since you know, this discovery, some what now, uh, you know, a decade and a half or so or more ago, uh, the community has discovered a wide array of structurally diverse uh, uh, 2D materials uh, that have many of which have been isolated, continue to be isolated, continue to be synthesized. And this, of course, leads to a wide array of electronic properties uh, uh, from insulating to semiconducting, metallic superconducting, and so on. And then perhaps one of the most common slides that you ever see in any talk about 2D materials, yes, is this one uh, uh, that I know many of you have seen mi millions of times before, this idea that we can stack 2D materials on top of each other, uh, like atomic scale Legos. Okay, great. Now, what I'm gonna talk to you about is another degree of freedom that is possible with these systems where unlike Legos, where they, in the, the, the blocks kind of lock into place and my kids love to play with them here, when you take two layers of a 2D material, as many of you know, it turns out that you can actually control the interlayer uh, uh, azimuthal misorientation between the layers of so the interlayer twist angle. And this gives rise to a longer range periodicity called the moiré super lattice uh, with a periodicity that is determined by the twist angle. And all you're seeing in this uh, twist angle, for those of you uh, perhaps who are not so familiar with this field, is you're just seeing a modulation in the crystallographic registry uh, between the two layers as you move from one uh, portion of the moiré super lattice to the other. And the significance of this longer range, uh, this longer range uh, super lattices, as we rotate the two layers in real space, their corresponding reciprocal lattices are also being offset from each other. And so that longer range periodicity of the super lattice manifests as a smaller reciprocal lattice uh, formed here, or you can think of as uh, being formed from the vertices of the two Brion zones uh, of the atomic lattices. And so an important point here is that the point of intersection between, uh, if let's say we had two graphene layers, the two sets of cones, that's controlled by the twist angle, right? And the size of the hybridization gap that is opened as a result uh, is governed by the extent of interlayer coupling or interlayer tunneling. Um, now, what I've shown here is just for the two of the, of the six uh, K points uh, of the mini Brion zone. Uh, but when we consider all six, what you end up with is that theory predicts that a series of magic angles, the band structure of um, twisted bilayer graphene uh, should display uh, these extremely flat electronic bands where the, the band uh, uh, velocity uh, becomes vanishingly small. And, and, one, and you know, the first magic angle is about a degree, but a series of other angles are also anticipated or predicted. Uh, but importantly, these calculations assume a rigid graphene layer. So what was really exciting, um, I think just as I was leaving uh, CIQM, um, although the, the, some of the exciting uh, discoveries had, had been sort of leading up to that, was that in 2018, um, 
uh, the Harir Harir group was successful in performing experiments to identify what might happen in such Mars super lattices and the observed range of correlated electronic phases, including unconventional superconductivity at, at the first magic angle. And since then, as many of you know, other twisted 2D materials have been shown to display all kinds of twist tunable electronic properties and, and, and exciting up to electronic properties in the semiconducting systems where excitons can be localized, manipulated by the Mars super lattice and so on. Okay. Now, in my group, we sort of looked at these um, Mario super lattices and we started, you know, you know, being inspired by the STM work that had, had been uh, performed to, to look at the, the density of states profile of some of these systems. We started wondering whether the, um, these flat bands could actually be used as a handle to modulate interfacial charge transfer because I told you how uh, when you have defects, on the surface of, of materials that creates localized states that then can enhance, facilitate uh, charge transfer. And so we looked at, uh, but the defects, you know, atomic defects and steps and things like that, they're notoriously difficult to control chemically. So we wondered if these flat bands could be used as a more controllable way to modulate an facial charge transfer at surfaces. So we went ahead and did that experiment. It took us a while to figure out how to make the samples and the way we needed to make them to be able to do the experiment and then also to be able to reliably take these measurements, but we got there eventually. And so we use a technique called scanning electrochemical cell microscopy or SECCM, which allows us to measure electrochemical kinetics of um, microscopic electrodes by basically we pull a, uh, a capillary, uh, uh, we heat it with a, a CO2 laser, pull a, a quartz capillary until it, it tapers off and breaks. And then it forms a nice little nanopipette uh, at the end here with a diameter that's maybe anywhere from, we can control it from let's say 10 to 300 or 500 nanometers or larger. Um, and then we fill that with the electrolyte of interest. And then a small droplet protrudes from the base of this uh, pipette and we can basically use it as a scanning probe and we can perform electrochemical experiments within this little droplet. And so we fabricate twisted uh, bilayer graphene <clears throat> electrodes as, um, uh, as per usual, but in this case, the surface of the twisted bilayer graphene is, is exposed. So for those of you who are in the know, it's, you know, you just flip the, the stack. Um, if you know, you know. Um, but um, anyway, and so the surface then is exposed and we can get, use STM uh, uh, at room temperature just to map out the, the Mario super lattice and see that it is uniform uh, over the sample and, and so on. Okay. And so then we can do an experiment, do a simple experiment called a cyclic voltammogram. And in this experiment, all we're doing is we're sweeping the applied voltage between our electrolyte and um, which is in this pipette and our, our, our uh, twisted bilayer graphene surface. And we're measuring the current that is flowing across the interface. In this sense, we're sort of gating the material, but we're measuring the leakage current, right? Um, if, if, uh, uh, for, for any of the physicists in the audience. And the leakage current corresponds to the rate of uh, interfacial charge transfer, uh, where we're studying this very, uh, you know, prototypical redox couple involving a ruthenium-3 to ruthenium-2 uh, uh, reaction. So if we take a monolayer of graphene and we sweep this voltage, this is what we see. We see this blue curve, the dark moving forward and the, the lighter a trace in the reverse. So you see this sort of S-shaped curve that is offset from this uh, potential that I've depicted as enoch, which is simply the thermodynamic potential uh, of this redox couple. It is where this redox, this uh, reaction should proceed thermodynamically reversibly. However, you can see that the midpoint of this S curve is offset from that, and that is because the kinetics are slow. So you need to put in extra potential to make the reaction take place at an appreciable rate. If you go to a bilayer of graphene, you see that that curve shifts a little bit more to the right. It gets a little bit easier or kinetically more facile. And this is simply because you have more densities of states for bilayer graphene than monolayer graphene. If you go to bulk graphite, sure enough, you see that this S-shaped curve is centered at that thermodynamic potential, telling you that you're at the reversible limit. There, there's a minimal uh, uh, activation energy barrier for you to overcome to do this chemistry. So what happens then if we take two layers of graphene, just like the gray, but instead they are twisted to um, about 1.1 degrees. Now we see that actually the kinetics behave the way bulk graphite does for all intents and purposes. We have uh, effectively reversible kinetics uh, at this surface. And it, we, we spend a fair bit of time thinking about what is going on here because it turns out that 
in, in with quantum materials, when you're doing electrochemistry, and this could be nanotubes, it could, you know, all kinds of systems that, um, you know, people are using, uh, you know, like MOS2 for, for hydrogen evolution reactions and so on. It is really important, though not often, not always considered, that the electrochemical polarization that you apply not only uh, uh, serves to, to, to lead to a voltage drop across the electrochemical double layer, as I showed in one of the earlier slides, but it actually serves to gate or dope the material. And many of you will already be familiar with this because uh, in the physics community, we use, for instance, ionic liquids and other sorts of um, techniques, right, as a way of gating and doping materials. But, but in, among chemists, we don't always think of this effect of gating and doping uh, when we're doing electrochemical reactions, but it's really important to consider that uh, in, in the context of, of these atomically thin materials, because when you apply a voltage, not only are you, is some, some of that voltage is dropping across the double layer, this is my EVDL uh, energy, and then some of that uh, uh, goes to what's known as the quantum capacitance, so basically uh, gating the material itself. And you have to consider these two effects if you're going to be able to explain uh, what, what we're seeing. And so the way to think about this um, in sort of a, a, a circuit is that you have this quantum capacitance, which is in, in, in a series with your double layer capacitance. Okay, and this is really important for electrochemistry of low dimensional materials, but it's not always considered. And so the first thing that we learned was that what is going on is that, you know, I should say all these measurements, they're at room temperature, right? The electrochemistry is happening at room temperature. Um, and what these this twisting is doing is it's sort of making the the bilayer graphene look electrochemically, look chemically almost like a bulk metal because it's generating this large density of states close to the Fermi level. And I'll show you how important it is to match uh, where those flat bands are uh, uh, to uh, the, the chemistry that you're trying to do. I'll show you that in a little bit. But the first thing we learn is that these, this twisting is making uh, the, the bilayer graphene behave almost like a bulk uh, metal. Um, electrochemically, at least, okay, and, and it's it's helping to uh, it's controlling how voltage is being partitioned between the double layer and the quantum capacitance. And so we can go ahead now, and we don't just do one uh, have one twist, and we can make samples at different twists. And you can see from the STM data uh, that we can you know control the twist angle uh, from relatively small to relatively large. And so when we can get our electrochemical data at each of these cases, and what we see is that there is a strong modulation of the electrochemical, uh, the interfacial charge transfer as you change the twist angle. So this is on a logarithmic scale uh, or semi-log scale versus a uh, uh, twist angle. And uh, uh, so uh, you see that the, you know, the, the rate for this reaction increases quite significantly over about an order of magnitude. And then in the vicinity of about one to 1.5 or so degrees, uh, you have, we, we uh, measure this, uh, you know, maximum rate, which is almost reversible uh, electrochemistry. And then beyond that, it sort of starts to, to drop off. But that's just for one molecule that, or type of molecule that we measure. If we look at another example, this cobalt molecule, and we study the interfacial charge transfer with that, we find instead that the effect of the twist angle is strongly quenched. Um, so not only do we see minimal uh, enhancement, but actually if you, you know, you know, looked at this with the mother's loving eye, you would say that, well, the, the, the maximum is, is at a much higher uh, uh, angle. The, the maximum small as it is, uh, or uh, subtle as it is, is at a much higher angle. And the reason for that, it turns out this points to the importance of the, 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 the flat bands of the twisted bilayer graphene and the and density of states enhancement being well aligned with the particular uh, formal potential of the molecule that you're trying to oxidize or reduce. So in the case of our ruthenium molecule in red, we have pretty good alignment with where we expect these flat bands to be. Uh, uh, so we do see an enhancement uh, an, or an effect of twist. Whereas with our cobalt uh, molecule, by the time we apply enough potential to drive this reaction, we've already moved our Fermi level far enough away from where these flat bands, broadened as they might be at room temperature, from where they are, that we basically see uh, no enhancement. And in fact, you can explain why the enhancement is at a larger angle from the fact that at larger angles, you would expect that your Van Hoff singularities of your twisted bilayer graphene would then 
still they'll be smaller than what you get at at at, at uh, one point one degrees, but they would uh, be better over overlapped with the cobalt phenanthrene. Okay, so let's think about this a little bit more. What do these flat bands mean? Well, flat bands um, in in our band structure in real space they mean localization, right? And so this is this is effectively what we see in the STM data. This is what other people have seen, other people have calculated. But just to show you. Um, if, if you look at the local density of states for AA saddle point and, and AB or BA stacking, you see that at 1.1 degrees, your uh, uh, electronic states are strongly localized on the AA sites, that's what you see. And then if you go to about three degrees, then there is less discrimination between one stacking orientation and another. And this is just as you expect, so nothing too surprising there. So what we're learning, first of all, we can explain why there's this drop off at large angles as simply because we're eliminating the flat bands as we go to larger angles. There's nothing too surprising there. But there is a question of what is happening at these smaller angles. And to understand that, we've got to switch gears a little bit and think about what the true structure of twisted bilayer graphene is. So the simple model I showed you assumes that the lattice is very rigid, okay? And that you have this gradual transition between one stacking orientation and another. But it turns out that finite elements simulations and, and, and electron microscopy data, which I'll show you in the next slide, uh, suggest that there, there is a relaxation process that entails a series of local rotations. This is work, uh, uh, this paper here, this Nature Materials paper 2019 is actually work from, from Philip's group, uh, Hyobin and Rebecca uh, did this work um, showing that uh, there's a, uh, 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 suggesting that there's, there are a series of, of relaxation processes that involve AB counter rotation against the moiré twist and AA rotation in the direction of the moiré twist that serve to increase the size of the lower energy AB or BA stacking, or you know, for organic chemists, right, those are sort of the, the staggered conformations, right? And then shrinking the size of the eclipsed conformations of the AA domains. Um, and so what we were really interested in, in doing is, is, is measuring uh, these rotations a little, uh, a little bit quantitatively. Uh, dark field TM, again, this is Hyobin and, and, and Rebecca's work, had shown that this lattice relaxation is indeed taking place, particularly, uh, it was particularly clear at small angles. And, and, and so one of the outstanding questions that we had was, can we measure you know, experimentally the exact amounts of these rotations and what might we learn from that if we could do such an experiment? The, our approach to, 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 to accessing you know, these quantitative measurements of of the relaxation was to measure strain, because it turns out that uh, relaxation or atomic reconstruction, as it's called, it's an intrinsic material property of, of these twisted structures. Um, and, and so we have to understand this pro process. And because these relaxa relaxations are predicted to introduce intralayer strain that builds up as a direct consequence of the relaxation, we wanted to measure strain as a conduit to quantitatively um, uh, understanding the relaxation process and measuring it. Uh, there's another type of strain which is uh, extrinsic. This is uh, one example. This is uniaxial heterostrain, and this is just a form of strain that arises where one layer stretch relative to the other, and so that deforms their moiré superlattice and breaks its symmetry. And so the goal we had, which uh, helped us to understand the chemistry we were seeing, was this quantitative visualization of strain and this interplay between twist angle, heterostrain, and relaxation. And the tool we use to do that, uh, to take these measurements is called four-dimensional scanning transmission electron microscopy. And this is a technique where we take an electron beam, we converge it and scan it over the sample, right? And scan it in, in two dimensions in Cartesian coordinates in the sample. And then we acquire a diffraction pattern at each probe position where maybe each probe is separated by anywhere from, let's say five angstroms or 10 angstroms or less uh, uh, from each other. And so it's called four-dimensional stem simply because we acquire this two-dimensional diffraction pattern at each you know, two-dimensional uh, 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 scanning over two dimensions in, in real space. And so our data set then is this 4D stem stack uh, of, of, of diffraction, uh, diffraction data. Okay, now what we initially set out to do was to use traditional 4D stem strain mapping. 4D stem has been around for a few years. Uh, traditional 4D stem strain mapping where we would basically map uh, or, or, or analyze the centroids of our diffraction disks. They are disks because the beam is converging. Uh, and so 
on our diffraction plane, we get, we get disks, not points. So what we set out to do was to map the deformation of the reciprocal lattice as we move from one point to another. That was a problem because of the very types of samples we were studying. First of all, they're very light elements, uh, right, carbon. And also because we're using this convert beam so that we can get the spatial resolution, we have disks now in our diffraction patterns. And so they are overlapping with each other. And so we have low signal to noise generally coupled with overlapping disks that made it impossible for us to accurately enough determine the centroids of each uh, spot or each disk to do to use traditional strain mapping. Uh, so instead, what my really ingenious uh, students, Maddie and Nathaniel, did was they actually found a way of leveraging the very fact that these disks were overlapping to do an interferometry experiment. So they came up with this Bragg interferometry method uh, to, to analyze and, and extract quantitative information. I should point out that because we offset the hexagonal boronitride capping layers from the graphene, they don't play into our analysis. Um, and so we can do all analysis by selecting only what's going on in the graphene layers. And this is uh, really, really convenient and is a benefit of using the diffraction approach. Okay, now to understand exactly what happens and how this interferometry works, we need to understand that the, 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 the modulation in crystallographic registry that we see can be represented in terms of a, dis, a displacement vector, which is simply the vector connecting one atom in, in, of, of a carbon atom in one layer to its counterpart atom in the other layer. So AA stacking, for instance, has a displacement vector of magnitude zero. And then saddle point, these intermediate stackings, or ABBA, those have uh, finite uh, displacement vector magnitudes and specific directions. And the consequence of this idea of displacement vector is that the, bra the, the, the overlap intensity, when these beams from the two uh, Bragg disks overlap, they are either going to constructively uh, interfere or destructively interfere. And the intensity of the overlapped region now, so the overlap region is proportional to this, uh, or is given by this function here, where you have this dot product between the graphene reciprocal lattice vector and the displacement vector. And so you can sort of envision that for this case of a saddle point type stacking, where you expect complete constructive interference uh, between U and G, or the between the the two uh, 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 scattered uh, electron uh, waves and uh, complete destructive interference for this uh, uh, reciprocal lattice vector. And so the, the, the significance of this is that looking at the overlap regions and, and those overlap regions comprise a significant portion of the entire signal because the twist angles are so low, but looking at the overlap regions, you effectively get different diffraction patterns for different stackings, all right? But just to emphasize that we're looking at the overlap region, if you look very closely, you do see the regions of the signal where the beams are not overlapping and we don't use that. So we don't just sort of binary, you know, or, you know, sort of assign different uh, uh, stackings to uh, a particular diffraction pattern. What we do is more quantitative where we take our experimental uh, convergent beam electron diffraction pattern and actually fit a displacement vector to that, minimizing the residuals um, uh, you know, going with that uh, function I, I described. And then we can uh, assign each um, pixel to then uh, inside this displacement legend where we encode information about the X and the Y uh, components of that displacement vector. So that this is a, a hue value color scheme where the hue or color gives you information about the angle of that displacement vector. And then the value of the brightness or darkness gives you information about the magnitude of that displacement vector. So then we end up with maps that look like this, which are uh, vector valued uh, displacement maps where each pixel, the color of each pixel encodes information about the displacement vector at that point. And so here is a sampling of data set going from uh, 0.16 all the way up to 1.03 and we go further than that. <laughs> okay, and so you can see these uh, sort of different boundaries now between the various stackings. Once again, emphasizing the, the point that we have some sort of relaxation process going on as, as we suspected from the previous uh, experiments. But the nice thing about uh, this technique is that for even you know, fairly large, relatively large twist angles, we can uh, map uh, these uh, mare super lattices over a fairly uh, a reasonable area. And so we can obtain some statistics, for instance, on uh, apparent twist angle disorder and, and disorder in heterostrain um, over these samples and, and use that then 
uh, to interpret what, what we see, as I'll show later. We can also look at the size of these domains because we can measure the saddle points, we can measure the AA regions, the AB regions. We can measure the size of those domains. And what we see is that the AA and saddle point uh, domain sizes are being attenuated by this relaxation process, uh, whatever it is, as we'll talk about in a bit, uh, from what you expect from a rigid moray. Now, because we have these vector valid displacement fields, we can go a step further. We can directly measure uh, and extract information about the strain because it turns out that from infinitesimal strain theory, if you take the gradient of a displacement field, you get the, the, the strain. And so for all our, our samples where we have these uh, displacement fields that we measure from Bragg interferometry, we can measure the shear strain uh, and, and a number of ways to represent the strain, uh, you know, the different tensor rotations. This is a way of visualizing it aniso uh, isotropically. Um, and, and, and you see that the strain is substantial both at small angles and approaching the magic angle region. And it is all localized uh, basically in these uh, saddle point regions. So that's the first thing that we learn. And this is an intrinsic strain that is always going to be present in twisted by the graphene. But we can go a step further because at each point, we take our, our displacement vector, we take its gradient, we end up with a strain tensor at each pixel. And that's what allows us to get, to get the, the uh, strain at, at each pixel. But that tensor can also be manipulated in a way to extract information about local rotations um, it, that are present in the sample. And so we can actually measure directly the relaxation deformations, the relaxation rotations that have taken place. And so we see uh, you know, direct experimental evidence then of the positive rotation in the AA regions and the negative rotation in the BA region. And we can actually put numbers on that from the experiment. And this is present at you know, all angles. So we can actually see that the rotations are present. We can map these local AA rotations as a function of the moiré twist angle. And I don't have a lot of time to get into the implications of these rotations uh, for the physics of uh, twisted bilayer graphene. The, but I'll summarize and say that because I want to tie this back into what we're seeing in chemistry, because some of you might be wondering how does this all matter for the chemistry, the electrochemistry I was showing, and I will get there. Um, but I just want to emphasize that what we find is that there are two regimes of reconstruction in these twisted structures. It's not just that the reconstruction relaxation turns on you know, below a degree or so, or, or, or 0.8 or so, it's actually that there, that there are two regimes of relaxation and so there are two competing rotation processes. One wins out at high, um, larger angles at about one degree and, 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 or above 0.5. The other wins out at lower angles. And uh, the one that wins out at lower angles is the uh, uh, AB counter rotation, which serves to make the bands more dispersive because it makes the material look more like, uh, like Bernal stack bilayer graphene. Whereas the one that wins out at larger angles is the AA rotation, which makes the material look more like overall like twisted bilayer graphene, if you will. And that actually is, serves to preserve the flat bands and isolate them from the more dispersive high align uh, uh, bands. And so that actually is one of the reasons why you have flat bands being frustrated at, at lower angles and being preserved at higher angles. Um, uh, uh, the relaxation process, in a sense, is actually beneficial to the flat bands uh, at that first magic angle. Okay, but what is the, what are the implications of all of this for you know the interfacial chemistry that I originally motivated all of this with? Well, going back to what we had measured, we showed I showed you that the the the, the uh, angle dependence of the electrochemistry follows this trend. What we can do is we can look at the rate constants, which in these cases are ensemble rate constants over, you know, the, over the entire moiré super lattice. And we can extract the, the, the rate constants at the AA site specifically. And that's because we have this geometric information from 4D stem, all right? So we can extract the, ro the, the local AA based rate constants. And what we find is that those are the dominant, uh, uh, um, uh, sites for this electrochemistry, though that is, those are the hot spots. That's where all the electrochemistry, the action is happening. Uh, and, and the rates at these AA sites actually show an increase and then they plateau, all right? So even as you go beyond, below 1.5 degrees or so, you don't see any 
change in the rate of chemistry per uh, unit area uh, uh, at an AA site, even though the global Mare twist has changed. All right, and in that sense, these AA sites are acting as defects, right? Remember I mentioned how defects enhance electrochemistry, but these defects are controllable in a sense by the twist angle. But why does, why do, does the rate plateau as you go below 1.5? Well, it turns out that we know that because of relaxation, the total rotation, the, if you were to sort of put blinders on and only look at the, the rotation at an AA site, you would see from our measurements uh, that the total rotation basically plateaus off. So even though the moiré twist is 0.2 degrees, locally at an AA site, it looks like 1.2 degrees. And so that is why you have this plateau in the chemistry, because what is happening is for all intents and purposes, for the purpose, in the purpose of case of chemistry, and this is at high temperature, those AA sites all look the same, all right? Um, and all you're doing as you change the twist angle in this regime is you're simply spacing out these hot spots, right? You're changing what we would call the active site density, all right? You're just changing the active site density as you go, uh, as you change the twist angle. And then beyond a certain point, then you start to just eliminate these flat bands altogether, which remember the flat bands at low angles are localized on these AA sites. And so that explains uh, this behavior in its entirety. Now, what we're really excited about is the fact that this platform is a really interesting uh, uh, um, tool for studying interfacial chemistry, right? We're working on twisted multilayers that I know many of you are, are really in interested in as well um, that show really interesting correlated phases. Not only can Bragg interferometry allow us to measure those structures uh, really precisely, but we're seeing very exciting electrochemistry uh, taking place uh, at those surfaces as well. And in principle, we can use electrostatic gates and other uh, knobs uh, to tune this uh, uh, electrochemistry and either align or misalign the flat bands um, with, with the redox couple that we're interested in. Okay, now we're, we're taking this in direction also of catalysis and saying, well, usually when we want to you know, tune the catalytic activity of a surface, we change the composition of the surface entirely and try to use that to change the binding strength of some intermediate. Right. Um, well, now we have a way of reconfiguring the band structure of a material without changing its co chemical composition, just by changing the twist angle and using that as a descriptor for uh, the uh, reaction rate. And so what we're really excited about is, is now, uh, and, and Tim is working on this uh, along with Ted, is using this as a way to, to control um, interfacial catalysis. All right, and then of course, we're extending Bragg inferometry to other marine materials. Uh, and I'll just show you, you know, here's some interferometry data from just TMDs and, and all that work is ongoing. Okay, I know I, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, so I will, because I want to make sure that we have time for questions, I will zip through this last bit um, on magnetism fairly quickly. So uh, when I showed this original um, uh, slide, and this is uh, Philip's review paper in 2018, you'll notice that in this figure, uh, you know, magnetic 2D materials didn't feature. And that's because, uh, you know, it, it was only in about 2017 that we started as a community uh, learning about van der Waals magnets with CGT and then later chromium iodide and other examples that even, that all of which show very interesting behavior and, you know, potentially even uh, room temperature operation perhaps in some cases. And there are interesting technological uh, implications for these maybe as replacing some other magnetic materials in, in, in schemes that we already have designed. But I think what's maybe more interesting is asking what are the unique opportunities to 2D magnetic crystals that could open up totally new um, paradigms of, um, of magnetic devices. Now in my group, we, we try to design um, magnetic uh, materials by looking at the interstitial sites. So for my time in Phillips group, I have a strong uh, bond, uh, pardon the pun, uh, with, um, with intercalation chemistry. And it turns out if you can get magnetic intercalants in between uh, the sheets of, of, of materials, then that, in, in that ligand field or crystal field around that uh, paramagnetic ion establishes uh, some uh, or can lead to some unquenched orbital angular momentum that then can lead to long range magnetism if these uh, materials uh, can be strongly enough or if these magnetic centers can be strongly enough coupled together. 
And so in, in uh, transition metal intercalated TMDs, you have intercalated ions that assemble into all kinds of ordered arrays that lead to a rich array of uh, or variety of physics, uh, ferromagnets, antiferromagnets, and spin glasses that can uh, switch the antiferromagnetic domains. This is work from uh, James Analytis' group here at, um, at, uh, at Berkeley. And, and you should, if you haven't already, you should have him out to give a talk on, on, on this material. And then even some uh, really interesting heliomagnetic, helical uh, magnetic states. And then there's this interplay between all these different uh, energy uh, in, in, these, in these systems. And so one question we wanted to know was, can we isolate 2D analogs of these sorts of, this family of materials? It's very, very difficult uh, to exfoliate them down and, and get to very thin layers because once they're intercalated, they're basically bonded. Uh, the layers are bonded together. So instead, what my group uh, uses is we, we start out with the, the neutral parent layers that are Van der Waals bonded, and then we use chemical intercalation to insert transition metals uh, between the layers. And, and I'll talk, uh, and lanthanides as well, I'll talk mostly about the transition metal case. So because I'm running out of time again, uh, what we can do is we can prepare Van der Waals heterostructures of these um, exploited uh, host lattices. We can intercalate them with um, uh, uh, some usually typically zero valent uh, precursors that then uh, you know, give up their ligands, enter the lattice and, and uh, uh, lead to charge transfer with the lattice. And then uh, in this case, forming iron two sites uh, in the interlayer. And those then assemble when we anneal them into uh, super lattice structures that we can uh, characterize by diffraction and, and also give rise to very distinctive Raman features associated with the, the iron super lattice. And then the big question we had then was, okay, what happens in these thin flakes when we cool them down and, and sweep the field? And sure enough, we see all the hallmarks of, um, of magnetic ordering, of ferromagnetic ordering. And impressively, these are extremely coercive materials. And that arises because you have this unquenched overland momentum from the iron two that uh, then uh, produces coercivities uh, that you know exceed you know uh, uh, two tesla or, or so, making these some of the most coercive two D magnets. And you know, I say two D magnets. I had only shown you data from a ten layer sample. We can get all the way down to the two layer case and show that even for the thinnest limit of this magnetic intercalation compound, sure enough, you see. Uh, evidence for long range magnetic order and really, really high coercivities, placing these materials uh, as some of the most coercive, uh, if not the most coercive uh, 2D magnets that we know of, uh, 2D ferromagnets that we know of to date. And one question, of course, uh, sort of from any application side is can you get those um, ordering temperatures higher? But there's still, even at low temperatures, a lot of interesting fundamental questions that we are we're starting to answer. Okay, uh, starting to ask. All right, so that's that's my talk today. I'm happy to answer questions. I apologize that I went so fast through the last bit, but I hope um, I'll put these main takeaways up on the slide at the end so that um, you can read them. I'd like to uh, spend the time instead thanking my research group uh, immensely for their efforts, uh, thanking um, uh, funding agencies for making this possible and, and a really all-star cast of, uh, of collaborators for working with us on, on various aspects of, of this effort. Uh, and so with that, I'd be delighted to answer, uh, try to answer any questions you might have about any of this. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, thank you very uh, much. A, a lot of nice uh, things that you've talked about. I have uh, for people, again, if you wanna ask a question, the way the software works is please type it in the Q&A or in chat and then we'll, uh, we'll read it and then we'll answer. Uh, so we have one question from uh, Daniel Larson. Hi, Daniel. Uh, <laughs> how can the droplet at the tip of the pipette distinguish yeah. bilayer from bulk graphite since it's only adjacent to one surface? Question mark. Yeah, great question. Um, well, I, I, I suppose even though it's only adjacent to one surface, there is a, um, there, the density of states at that surface, and this would be a question I, you know, happily flip back to you, Daniel, since you're the theorist. Uh, but the density of states at that surface um, is, 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 must be less, right, for the bilayer uh, than the bulk graphite. So that the overall, you know, uh, electrochemical process is still sensitive to the number of layers. So we see that, you know, you go monolayer, graphene, bilayer, trilayer, four layer, you know, um, uh, those all have, you know, increasing, uh, 
uh, kinetics for the electro um, for electrochemistry, and then um, the um, yeah even ABC versus ABA stacked uh, trilayer graphenes right rhombohedral stacking we see differences there that work will be coming out soon, um, and you can take a monolayer of graphene on a on a bilayer and make that kind of twisted trilayer sample and you know an interesting question is does that top surface look different from the bottom right so those are all questions that we're, we're working answering but but it does um and and i think you know it'd be nice you know to have some theory uh to help us understand what is how to think about those surfaces should i just go to the next question right away i see this oh if you can read well let me we'll yeah. be formal okay. here let me okay <laughs> We'll read the question and you answer. Uh, so Philip uh, Kim asks, does the Bragg interferometry imaging work for multi, uh, does the Bragg uh, interferometry right. imaging work for multi-layer twisted samples? Question. Yeah, hi, Philip. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, uh, it does. And so we, um, we have to uh, extend the fitting function so that it can accommodate more than one displacement vector, but it does. And, and so, we are uh, we are having getting some results there, uh, trying to you know understand what's going on in your systems with the magic angle trilayers, and uh, you know monolayers on bilayers, and you know in principle we can extend it to any number of samples, uh, any number of of, of layers because um, and uh, yeah and so with it you can we can partition out for instance how the layer one and layer three is overlapping relative to layer one and layer two, right? Because we can select the, the disks, uh, can, uh, they overlap significantly, but if we go to the higher order reflections, we can actually have them be separated out so that you have one disk, the second one, then it comes back to this one for the, yeah. So we can basically extract um, those different displacement vectors that way uh, as well. And so, yeah, we, we're hoping we can, we can shed some light on what's going on in some of your, your materials. Okay, we have another question from uh, Gabriel uh, Schlater. It says, great talk, thanks. Uh, could you give more insight into the electrochemistry, excuse me, electrochemistry enhancement question mark? Uh, would you then say that the contribution comes mostly from AA regions only question mark? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. The enhancement is coming almost entirely from, um, from the AA sites. The other, I'll show you the exact, uh, oh, sorry, I overshot here. There we go. So you can, okay. So here, the, the saddle points end up behaving very much like um, ABBA. Uh, uh, and we can measure the AB independently, at least zero degrees AB. Um, and then I didn't show sort of theoretical calculations of the rate constants, but we have those. Um, but the, you know, this is the you know, sort of AB rate constant, right? And, and the, the, this is what's, uh, how the, the AA rate constant evolves with the global Moiré twist. And so you know, at these modestly small twist angles, you know, the, the, the AA is doing all the heavy lifting. Um, and uh, so, you know, for instance, in trilayers, we see this number goes through the roof, right? Again, uh, where you could have, you know, depending on the type of trilayer, you can have AAA or ABB, and then it even goes up higher. So there we see variations that are maybe two orders of two, three orders of magnitude as you change the twist. So, so yes, Gabriel, uh, the enhancement or contribution is only coming from AA regions to the extent that you have this, right? So at, at, at larger twists, then it's, they're all the same effectively. Okay, uh, another question from uh, JB Groves uh, 3. Uh, I'm interested in modeling these processes using the example you used earlier uh, on using Lego block dimples. In theory, is each dimple a block sphere or could one think of it that way? Question mark. Huh, I'm not sure I understand. I have to confess, I'm not sure I understand the question entirely. You, you are referring to the Lego blocks from the um, from sort of the cartoon of stacking, um, that, um, 
this, these Lego blocks. Um, I think the cartoon here is just meant to depict that you can sort of stack these materials on top of each other. Um, I don't know that you'd think of the dimples of the black as those could be the, um, the individual atomic sites where maybe there usually can be some particular preferred stacking. But with that said, these layers can slide over each other as, as you've seen. Um, so they don't actually lock into place in that way. So I have to confess, I'm not, um, I, I wouldn't perhaps read too much into sort of these particular dimples, but maybe I'm not understanding your question. Okay, uh, uh, he reads back, yes, question, but uh, um, uh, are there additional questions? One last question. I'd be happy to, uh, if you want to send an email or something, uh, JB, happy to talk yeah. more about this. Maybe, yeah. okay. okay, one last question. Uh, if not, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, great stuff. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you again for the invitation. Yeah. Really appreciate it.